Hey, welcome to our YouTube channel. We hope this message that you're about to watch impacts and inspires you. If you'd like to watch the full service experience, click the link below in the description and we'll see you on the other side. Good stuff. So everyone online, welcome to you. Everybody here, welcome to you. It's so good to have you in church. And we are pumped about this series. Well, when I say we, I am. I hope you are too. Finding Greater Security is a, is, a, is a series that we started recently. And the reason this is important is ultimately the fact that so many of us are feeling the pressure uh, and, 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 and the difficulties and the uncertainties and even the indecisiveness of life at the moment. If we look at the, the political climate, there's uncertainty. We look at the economical and cl economic climate, it's, it's, it's uncertain. Schools, work, finances, all of these things can be massively uh, uh, uncertain, creating insecurity. The problem with, with being uncertain and the problem with being indecisive and even when it extends to its worst cousin, insecurity, the problem with all of those things is that ultimately we start to see less advancement and less progress in our lives. Now, this is critical. Progress brings dignity. Progress br um, brings hope. Progress brings expansion and improvement. So when we don't see progress, we begin to stagnate. And stagnation is a, devil, is, is, is a devilish thing. It holds you back. If you're not moving forward, you're actually going backwards. Think of it like this. If you leave a car in the garage, even if it's undercover, and you never drive it, it deteriorates. It's actually when you move it, when you take it, driving it somewhere where it makes progress, that it remains strong and healthy and usable. Yet when we, when we don't move forward ourselves, we start to stagnate and move backwards as well. The, the American philosopher, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, once said this, progress is the activity of today and the assurance of tomorrow. In other words, what we do today gives us dignity in the future. What we do today gives us hope for the future. What we do to get today helps give us sustained momentum. And maybe we can relate to that. Maybe the things that you've done in the past that you're reaping the benefit of today. Isn't that amazing? The things that you're doing in the past, things that you worked hard on that you're receiving the benefit of now. Maybe you stopped eating a lot of carbs in, in November and now you're a whole heap lighter. That was not the approach I adopted. <laughs> as you can tell. So if you're, if you're hoping to see progress, you need to, to do things today that give you hope and, and positivity for the future. Well, maybe there's some significant life changes that are happening in your life at the moment. Maybe, maybe you, 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 you're, you're immigrating. Maybe you've semigrated. Maybe you've come here from another town, another city. Maybe all of those things are quite complicated and difficult. Maybe you've started high school. Maybe you've started a new grade. Maybe you've started a new, a new degree at university. All of those things can be complex. Maybe you've started a new business or a new job, or maybe you've stepped into a, 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 new, a new position in the office. Whatever it is, those things are difficult to manage sometimes. The stresses and the uncertainties can build. Maybe you've had some important life-changing decisions that you still have to make. Maybe some of you today still support Liverpool. And maybe you know, deep down, like when you, when you come to church, you hear it. When you, when you walk down the streets, you hear it. When you're watching the Premier League on, on TV, you recognize it. You can hear the voice of God going, support Man United. You can hear it. I mean, there are people in this room today that still genuinely, I mean, I, I, how can you be a follower of Christ and do this? You support the Sharks. Maybe there's some more important life-changing decisions to make. That's just, no, it's not that small. The Lions, if you're asking for what the team to support, is really where you need to be. If you support the Cheetahs, or Province, or the Sharks, worst of all, the Bulls. Father, we just pray for those people. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's some addictions that you'd be trying to beat. Big life-changing decisions. Maybe there's a relationship that you hope to engage with. Maybe you want to take your, 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 your relationship to engagement to marriage potentially. Huge, huge decisions that can be very, very difficult and uncertain. You need to understand that you can move through those things. You can change. Maybe you're looking for answers for difficult, difficult questions. Can I encourage you to to navigate the questions you're asking. Why is this happening to me? Why did God allow it? Why is this happening to that person? These are good questions sometimes, but if we leave them to fester and grow, they can be very damaging. What are we allowing in our world? 
because what we allow in our world determines the levels of security in our world. And the good news is every one of these uncertainties, every one of these series of indecisive moments or the, the fears and worries that you have can be overcome if you look for answers in the right place. And that's what the series is all about. It's finding the correct answers, finding greater security. So you ready for that? We can look at part two today in just a moment, but I want to recap from last week because there's some important thoughts. That what is security defined as? Well, the dictionary just def defines security in two ways. Number one, it's a feeling of, of being safe and free from worry. Feeling safe and free from worry. Wouldn't that be amazing if we could do that with absolute confidence in Joburg? Wouldn't that be cool? It's a state of or feeling of being secure, freedom from fear and anxiety, danger and doubt. But look at this. It's a state or sense of being safety or of safety or certainty. In other words, if we had to summarize it down to a thought, security is, is feeling safe, free of worry, and having certainty. And the good news is that we can move in that direction. Imagine what could look, what our lives could look like, our relationships could look like, our businesses, finances, or even the nation could look like if we chose to find ways of becoming more secure. Finding greater security in every context of our lives. Imagine what that could look like. Well, God shows us that this is possible. And in fact, He gives us the baseline, the beginning point. It's kind of like the first step on the, on the staircase to security. And He says this in Proverbs 14, 26. Those who, say it with me when you see the bold stuff, those who fear the Lord are secure. Not those who may be secure, might be secure, at some point could get there. It's those who fear the Lord are secure. The basis of your security is the fear of the Lord. Now, this is important. We touched on this, but I'm going to touch on it again. Fear is not about being afraid. That word fear implies the idea of reverence and respect. The Lord is not your car or any other Lord. The Lord is the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. So bottom line is when you have respect and reverence for God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, you start becoming more secure. There's lots of reasons for this, but that's where it starts. And you and I need to recognize that you can, you can have r r r fear for your, for your finances. In other words, reverence and respect for your finances or your education or your skin color or your social standing or the car you drive or the house you live in. All of those things are not the right place in which to place your security. But when you have fear and, and reverence for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you start to become more secure over time. The problem is it doesn't happen quickly. It takes time. Just like any relationship that takes time to build. If you hope to get close with someone, if you hope to build a romantic relationship with them, or even a friendship with someone, it takes time. You go on lots of dates. You hang out with each other. You spend time learning and growing from one, from one another. You ask deep questions and share intimate ideas and thoughts. And that starts to develop strength. Well, it's the same with God. But here's the kicker. If we are to, to find greater security, we must, and this is really important, we must recognize, we must recognize that we've got to deal with two silent assassins that snipe away at our security. These assassins are sometimes very understated. You don't always see them coming and they shoot you dead. These assassins are often ignored and are often overlooked. And in fact, in worst cases, sometimes even celebrated. These two assassins are worry and anxiety. Worry and anxiety. So part two is called warding off worry. The word warding just means fighting off, removing from your life. Warding off worry and anxiety. Now, this is important to remember. Worry and anxiety are often misunderstood as the same thing. They're not. They have similarities, of course, but they're not the same thing. Worry and anxiety are two different emotional states. And the, the first thought about worry is that worry in, an, in and of itself is in the mind. Worry is in the mind. It is normally specific. It's about something. So you might be worried about your daughter's illness. You might be worried about tomorrow's meeting. You might be worried about the sore foot that you have. You could be worried about your finances. It's normally something that's specific and you're thinking about it. It's in the mind and it's normally fairly specific. It's also uh, temporary. It doesn't normally last. So in other words, as soon as that situation is resolved, your foot turns out to be okay. You, you get paid on time. The worry ultimately dissipates because it's in the mind. It's temporary and it's fairly specific. Uh, and it also has some kind of root in, in, in reality. 
I, 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 I'm a bit nervous about my car because it started to make a funny noise. It's not something you've imagined. It's like making a funny noise. I'm worried about my car. And then you have it checked and then it's all okay. The worry dissipates. So it has some kind of basis in reality. But if we nurture worry, bit of a dichotomy that if you nurture worry, in other words, you leave it to fester, you let it grow and even you entertain it, it leads to its evil assassin cousin, anxiety. And anxiety, on the other hand, is far more severe. Anxiety is both body and mind. So it's not just in the mind. It affects us physically. It has a physical impact. It's, it's generalized. It's seldom specific. It's even vague. You kind of, I feel anxious, but I don't know why I feel anxious. I'm not quite sure what I'm stressing about, but I just kind of have this sense of anxiety in my life. It, exaggerate, it exaggerates outcomes. In other words, something very small can be elevated into something extremely big. It, it, it's, it's, often, it's often illogical in that space. It's, it's enormous how much we can elevate or exaggerate what we're going through. And the, problem with, or the biggest problem with anxiety is it's long term. It, it doesn't dissipate quickly. You have to work through it. There's a process. There's techniques that you might have to get help with. And you might have to even see someone to help you along the journey. But the problem is when these, these two things are tied together, they lead to incredible damage in your life. Look at this. Uh, anxiety and worry leads to increased stress hormone production in the brain, and that leads to headaches and dizziness and muscle tension and insomnia, even depression. It, it, incre it increases your heart rate. It creates heart palpitations and chest pain, potentially high blood pressure and even heart disease. It's crazy. It causes stomach aches and nausea and diarrhea and a loss of appetite. It adversely affects our immune and respiratory system. So why would we want to live there? Some people in our lives, we all know this, we have someone in life. And if you don't have someone in life, it's probably you. You have someone in your life that has a supernatural gift of panic. They can panic about anything. And if they worry, they're happy. But if they don't worry, they're worried about why they're not worrying. Come on, if you, give me a wave if you know someone like that. Yeah, yeah. Give me a wave if it's you. Yeah, no, no, no. You see, these things start to cripple us and, and, and maybe you need to think, well, this is overcomable. I can move beyond this. It can be something I get under control. But again, you have to ask for answers in the right places. If you want to deal with anxiety, talking to your plumber is probably not the greatest place to start. You need to look for answers in the right place. And one of the right places, of course, in fact, the most helpful place is speaking to the expert. The expert, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, created everything we live in and see, and see today. God the Father, God the, Son, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit breathed wisdom into numerous people over the years who have documented their wisdom in a life-giving manual that changes everything, the Bible, the Word of God, the, the irrefutable Word of God that helps us to find answers. If you want answers, look in the right place. And that's why God spoke through one of his uh, most well-known, most effective leaders in history, a guy called Paul. And he wrote a letter, a set of instructions to help the church in Philippi learn to deal with some of the anxiety and worries that they were dealing. And he said this in Philippians 4 verse 6. Are you ready? He said, don't worry about anything. Say it with me. Don't worry. Now I want to pause for a moment because we often take the role of God in this space and we see someone in our lives is stressing and we say to them, don't worry. Do you know how unhelpful that is? On the greatest scheme of things, it's, it's, it's probably the most ridiculous, helpful advice we give. Don't worry. And ultimately, if you're truthful with the person receiving that, you're going to say, if it was that easy, I wouldn't worry. It's like saying to someone who's just fallen out of an airplane without a parachute, while they're falling, don't fall. They really don't want to be falling right now, but they are, right? That's what worry does. But you see, because God is the right person to speak to, Speak to your plumber, don't worry. Speak to your hairstylist, don't worry. Speak to your, your neurosurgeon, hey, just don't worry. Now, all of those people are right. We shouldn't worry, but they haven't helped us much. But if you talk to the right person, God the Father, God the Son, and God the, the Holy Spirit, you get a different answer. Look at this. Don't worry about anything. Next, next bolded thing. Shout out with me. Instead, pray about everything. Instead, pray. So when worry comes knocking, pray. When you're worried about your kids, pray. When you're worried about your husband, pray. When you follow Liverpool, pray. Whatever it looks like, pray. Just take time to pray. And then we might go, well, then I don't know what prayer looks like. But again, because you're looking in the right place, God gives us advice. He says this, next, next sentence, he goes like this. Tell God what you need and 
thank him for all he's done. And look at this, then. In other words, if you don't worry by praying and you tell God what you need and you thank him, then the outcome, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. It's an illogical peace. Things might be literally falling apart around you, but because you've prayed, because you've told God everything that you need, because you've thanked Him in the midst of this illogical nightmare, you have peace. It's illogical, doesn't make sense. It still works out that way. Then God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Say it with me. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things which are excellent and worthy and full of praise. Keep putting into practice. Say it with me. Keep putting into practice. Oh, that's the caveat. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the outcome, God's, the God of peace will be with you. That's powerful, isn't it? Because what God is trying to help us understand is that we can ward off worry by just putting a couple of techniques that he has designed into our daily lives that can change literally everything. And that's what we're going to navigate over the next few moments is how does this work? How do we make that work practically? What does that look like? It's why we need to find people around us to, 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 to work with us on this journey because God shows us precisely how to deal with worries, precisely how to deal with anxieties and uncertainties. But there's a caveat. Even though we know it, not everybody's going to find that helpful because unless we apply verse 9, keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me. Unless we do that, there will be no, no adequate result. We cannot hear it today and go home, to, go home and then tomorrow everything's sorted. You've got to hear it today and apply it from this moment on every day. Every piece of in, in, instruction that God gives us, the precepts he's giving us, the, the hope that he's given us has to be applied every single day. And so often we look at God's word as a set of rules and instructions, but seldom, it, seldom is that true. There are times where there are commands and instructions, but for the most part, God is inviting us to apply precepts that will change everything. Maybe we should change our mindsets a little. God is instructing me. No, no, no. God is inviting me. God is giving us an option. He's not going to force us to do anything. If we choose not to apply the invitation or accept the invitation, that's on us. The consequences will still remain the same. So if you don't keep putting into practice what we're going to learn today, you can live stressed and worried. That's up to you. But what if you don't want to be stressed and worried all the time? What if you don't want to be, to, to be restricted and held back and constrained by anxiety? Well, then apply his principles. Change your life. All okay? You happy? And that's why we've got to ask ourselves a profound question. Are you ready for this question? Am I ready and willing? This is key. Am I ready and willing to commit to applying God's word in my life? Am I ready and willing? We can be ready but unwilling. Am I ready and willing? And not just some of his word, all of his word. So whatever God says about relationships, apply. Whatever God says about finances, apply. Whatever God says about words, apply. Whatever God says about faith, apply. Whatever God says about economy, apply. Whatever God says about raising children, apply. Whatever God says about marriages, apply. Whatever God says about worry and anxiety, apply. We have to choose whether we're willing to do that. And sometimes it means we've got to apply something without fully understanding it. And the argument I hear often, yeah, but I don't understand God's word, so how do I apply it? Well, sometimes we need to apply before we understand. And once we've applied, we will understand. Think of a small child for a moment. If you say to a small child, a toddler, don't touch the, the, don't touch the light because it's hot. They don't understand what hot is. They don't understand how heat is generated. They don't understand potential energy. They don't understand any of that stuff. But when you've told them enough not to touch it, they stop touching it. And as they get older, they start understanding, oh, that's why it's hot. Likewise, with God's word, we have to figure out at times that application happens before understanding, but once we've seen application, we gain understanding. It takes a bit of time. And if you are willing, genuinely, if you are willing and ready to apply God's word in every part of your life, 
then things will start to change. You'll start to see a difference. You'll start to see improvement. You really will. So what do we need to do? Here, start here. Convert worry into a conversation with Jesus. Convert worry into a conversation with Jesus. Christianese word, pray. Convert worry into a conversation with Jesus. So when, when worry comes knocking on the door of your heart or the door of your mind rather and starts to, to, to give you that kind of a pressure, you can, you can learn to convert it into a conversation with Jesus. Let me in, let me in. Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. You can choose not to let that worry infest your mind. If you open the door to worry, worry comes in. Worry is not that, that visitor that gets uh, uncomfortable when it feels unwanted. You know, like that friend that comes for dinner and doesn't appropriately know when to leave. Like it's 12.30 and you really, you like, I mean, your wife has literally fallen asleep in, in, in her pudding and, and they're having a whale of a time. Just a hint, just say to them, would you like a coffee just before you leave? Uh, works well. But worry doesn't even take that hint. When worry comes into your mind, it likes to settle. It moves in. It brings all its friends. It brings anxiety with it. And they kind of settle in your brain and makes a home. And it also doesn't pay rent. It just hangs there. And it reminds you regularly that it's there. No, life's not going to be okay. It's going to suck. Man United are going to lose a game. And that's been a whole lot of true, isn't it? For, for those of you godly people that love, love and support Man United, we, we still convert our worries into conversations with Jesus. My son and I prayed yesterday because my word, Man United need every prayer they can get in Jesus' name. Good man. Stop worrying is a useless statement. But if we can take that conversation or that worry and convert it into a conversation with Jesus, everything starts to change. If simply hearing an instruction was enough, we would do it. It isn't enough. We have to do something different. Look at this. Don't worry about anything. Instead, don't worry about anything. Instead, don't worry about anything. Instead, there's an instead. There's an instruction, an alternative, a, a variation to this, what, this, this idea. What, instead of worrying, pray about everything. And, and that means that we, when we start to pray, we convert the worries that we have into a meaningful conversation with Jesus and he starts to own it. Because when we hand the worry to Jesus, he's the best equipped to deal with it, not us. So what we do is when we convert this, this worry into a conversation with Jesus is that we start to shift two areas of our life. We start to shift the focus of our, of our, of our confidence and the focus of our dependence. So what happens is we place confidence in God's wisdom and provision. When we start to, to, to converse with Jesus about the nature of what we're worried about, we start placing our confidence in Him and not misplace our confidence in our own abilities. Because our, our abilities are limited. Even the most intelligent of us in this room, even the most gifted, gifted of us in this room, even those of us who have got PhDs in everything, we're still limited in our understanding. Jesus Christ has unlimited, unrestricted, infinite ability. So when we hand over our worries to Him, we start placing our confidence on His ability to resolve issues and not our own ability to resolve issues. Does that make sense? We move the, the resolution of the situation from us to Him. This is not a, a, an argument for not doing anything at all. We still need to do our bit, but the point is we don't have to think about it and let worry fester. So not only do we, we shift our focus, the focus of our confidence and place it on Him, but we move our dependence over to Him as well. We move our dependence from education and finances and social standing and, and even from friends onto family, and, uh, friends and family onto Jesus. We say, listen, Jesus has the immutable, unlimited protection element that we can never fully understand. Jesus can protect us against anything and will guide us through anything and will shape us through everything. So we put our dependence on Him. So not only do we have the confidence that Jesus has got this, but we can also depend on Jesus for making the outcome change. And as soon as we recognize that worry comes to visit, we wrap it up the conversation, the worry, and give it to Jesus in a conversation. We take that worry and we hand it to Him. It's kind of like saying this, Jesus, I, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm facing this, but you know what? I need to give this to you. And if it helps, you can even do that 
in some kind of example, some kind of analogy, some kind of symbolism. You can just picture a box in your hand with all your worries chucked in and hand it over to Jesus. Picture Jesus taking it from you. Okay, hey, listen, I've got this. The problem, though, is that once we've given it to Jesus, we've got to keep putting it into practice. Because what most of us will do, give it to Jesus at 8 o'clock in the morning. And at 8.05, hey, 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 Jesus, hey. I want it back. And Jesus is going, well, if you want to. Because Jesus doesn't force us to do anything. Jesus is going, listen, I'm, I'm quite willing to carry this for you. And I'll sort this for you. But if you want to carry it, really, really, if you want to carry it, that's up to you. Yeah, yeah, I think I'll carry it. And the rest of the day sucks. And then in the morning, we should give this to Jesus. Lord, listen, I would like to give you back my worry. Now, if I was Jesus and if you were Jesus, you'd say, no, you took it back. Suffer on, booty. But because Jesus is Jesus and God is God and none of us are, thank heavens for that. He goes, all right, I'll take it for you. 8.05. Hey, 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 Jesus, listen, change my mind once again. And Jesus is patient. He goes, Do you, I, I'll carry it. I'll carry it for you. But if you want it, okay. So when we keep putting it into practice and the worry comes to visit at 8.05, we go, no, 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 no worry. You have no rental space in here. I have given this to Jesus. He's got it. And we keep putting it into practice over and over again. And the challenge, though, for some of us is we don't even know where to start. It's kind of like praying can be difficult. How many of us, come on, don't, don't raise your hands, but just think about it. How many of us online, even in this room, how many of us have ever got to the point where we go, I don't quite know how to pray? I don't know where to start, but because God is so good, he carries on telling us, instead, pray about everything. He says, tell God what you need. Thank him for all he has done. Some translations even say this, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And I think that's the better place to start. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So where do we start? Well, here it is. Here's two ways that we can start. If we're going to turn or, or, or convert our worry into a conversation with Jesus, start here. Thank him. Today, we were singing a song written by Maverick City. Thank you. Thank you. What do we say thank you for? I don't know. Anything. Say thank you to Jesus. Lord, thank you that I woke up today. Thank you that there's rain. Thank you that there's no rain today. Thank you that the grass is green. Thank you that I've got a house. Thank you that my car is in the garage. And I thank you that you're going to get it fixed at some point. Even in the worst situations, we've got something to be thankful for. Thank you. Thank you that I'm breathing. Thank you that my kids are at school today. Thank you that school started because December was a long month. Thank you. Thank you. Find a reason to say thank you. Thank God for your wife. That's easy. It's hard, ladies, to thank God for your husband. I get it. But say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for my teenagers. Thank you that I'm pregnant. I'm not. Just saying. It looks like it, but I'm not. Thank you. Just say thank you. And I want to encourage you to write down what you are thank you, thank, thank, what you're thankful for. When, when you say thank you to God, write them down. Use your, a smart device. Use a, a computer. Use a pad. Use a journal. I encourage you to journal all the time because when you start writing things down, you start to realize, oh my word, there is so much that I can be thankful for. We start to recognize that there are many things that we've worried about in the past. And look how many of them have been sorted out. Because most of the things we worry about seldom come to, to, come to bear. Our minds shift from, from worry to gratitude. And as we start writing these things down, we start to realize, wow, I've got some hardships, but my word, look how much I've got going for me. Look how, look how, 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 how lovely it is to have all of these things going on in my life. I've got an amazing family. I've got a job, but I might not like it, but it's, it's a job. I get paid. I live in a nation that is filled with beauty. And yes, it's got its issues, but thank you for having life in Africa. Thank you for all that I have. And the confidence starts to build. Because once you start writing it down, every time you look at it, you're reminded over and over again that I can be thankful. Thank you. Thank you. Write it down. And as you start to write it down, psychologists will tell you just the act of writing things down starts to bring confidence. The second thing we do is we tell God what we need. Now, of course, Jesus knows everything we need. It's not like he's surprised by it when we tell him. He knows everything we need. He genuinely knows everything we need. But the reason we should tell him is not because Jesus needs to be reminded, but rather because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have one mandate 
and one request of us and one desire for us. And that is friendship with him. Think about it. Only when you and I choose to have conversations with people that are meaningful, that share our innermost desires and thoughts, do we actually become true friends? That friendship is established through sharing of our lives. It's no different with Jesus. If you want to have an intimate relationship with Jesus, we need to be willing to share everything. He already knows, but the act of us sharing, the act of us declaring it verbally, the act of us writing it down, the act of us celebrating with him and talking with him enables us to strengthen and grow and builds that intimacy every single hour of every single day. And we start to draw closer to him. And when we draw closer to him, the confidence follows. So tell him everything that you need. Press into that friendship every single day. Share it with him. Lord, man, I need a wife. Oh, Lord, I need a husband. I'd really like a good looking one, though. <laughs> Not like my pastor looks pregnant. <laughs> Lord, I, I would really appreciate a new car. Lord, I'd appreciate a job that is meaningful, that can help me grow. I'd like a parking, please. Now, many of you might be thinking, do you pray for parking? I do. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, God's got more important things to worry about. I'm sure he does. But in that moment, parking matters to me. And I'm hoping that he cares. And often, Lord, I need a good parking. And he goes, hey, Trev, there's one there. Oh, chop, chop. <laughs> it's amazing how many things that we can lay before Jesus and how many things he gives us when we're just willing to have a conversation with him. Look at the outcome. Then you will experience God's peace. Isn't that what security is? Safety, freedom from worry, certainty, a peace that overwhelms us. So can I encourage you, convert your worry into a conversation with Jesus. You been help today? Last one as we come to a close. Develop a healthy thinking diet. Develop a healthy thinking diet. What we put in comes out. What we put into our heads comes out. We have no option about that. You can see on the platform is that we've got all sorts of healthy things. Fruit and veg, everywhere. Each of the things on the platform are just healthy. They're not bad. They're not good. They don't have to replace anything. You might look at this and go, oh, are you telling me to be a vegetarian? Absolutely not. <laughs> but think about it for a moment. If you, anything like me, savory things are, are, are nicer to me than sweets. If I never see a chocolate again, I don't think I'll even care. But take away crisps or pies. Mmm. That's more difficult for me. Steers, fries. <laughs> Roast potatoes. Did I say we're fasting? I did tell you we're fasting. Eh? And uh, think of roast potatoes for a moment. when Perfectly golden on the outside and crisp, but soft on the inside. And when you pierce it with your fork, it cracks. <laughs> and you cut it open and the steam billows out. And then you pour rich lamb gravy onto it. Mm. It's good though. <laughs> and those steers fries, maybe half the win of the steers fries is that salt. You know that when you open that little steers package, you hear the angels singing, you know it. But we might look at all of those things and go, well, those are, they're not necessarily terrible for you, but they are, eat too much of it. It's not great for you, right? And you might look at an apple and go, yeah. We've just spoken. We've just spoken about roast potatoes covered in gravy. Roast potatoes covered in gravy, apple. This is really near. But if we eat a whole heap of roast potatoes with gravy, you'll look like me. That's a problem. You'll get unhealthy. You might get heart disease and other issues. But if you eat a lot of apples, you're healthy. Likewise with our thinking. Sometimes the things we think about are really gratifying when they're negative and gross and angry and vendetta-like. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. When someone at the office says something to you and you go home at night, you're lying in bed thinking, hmm, if I see them walk at the mall of the south, 
and they're walking up that ramp where I park, I'll drive right over them. And then I'm going to put it in reverse just to make sure I got it done. You've been there. Don't judge. Or maybe you're lying in bed at night thinking about it. Well, next time she says this, I'm going to say this. <laughs> I'll tear her heart out with my hands. Bite it in half. And we start to have these weird conversations with ourselves. And we build scenarios. Like if she says this, I'm going to say that. And then everyone around me will go, oh. And it feels so gratifying. It feels like, oh, yeah. What we're doing is just planting the seeds of bitterness and we're going to stay bitter and grumpy and angry. But when, we, when that, that, that kind of feeling comes in, we can just think of other things. Go, Lord, yeah, I know she's an absolute cow, but I'm going to pray for her. Lord, pray, bless the cow. In Jesus' name. Because you see, our thinking diet is everything we pour into our minds and focus our minds on. Everything that we think about starts to fester and grow. So what happens if we change it? Look what God tells us. Fix your thoughts on what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. You see, fix your thoughts means think and action. It's not just a thought. And the reason for this is because whatever we think leads to actions. What we spend our thinking on ends up on what we act on. Never forget this. The focus of our thinking leads to the focus of our actions. So what we start to thinking differently, when we fix our thoughts on good things, positive things, uplifting things, it changes everything. Stop listening to social media. Stop listening to the news all the time. Yeah, but I want to keep in touch. Fantastic. Keep in touch once. Pick a moment. I'm not suggesting that we don't keep our eyes open to the things around us, but for goodness sake, if you keep focusing and listening and pouring junk into your thinking, only junk is going to come out. Start having conversations with good people, healthy people, inspiring people, people who want to encourage and help you to be better. Stop looking at people that are going to give you negative moments and gripe about everything. Stop listening in those spaces. That's why connect groups are helpful. Have a bowl of connect group. Because a connect group will help inspire you to apply God's word and change. That's why church services are so important. Have a church service bowl. Not a pokey bowl, a church service bowl. Come and get inspired and motivated with good things. Have a, have a reading of God's word bowl. Spend time reading and praying. Spend time learning and growing. Have a worship bowl. Find space to grow and learn. We've got a, an encounter night coming up. It's a bowl of really healthy things that are going to change your outcome of your life. Why? Because when we think differently, it removes toxins from our thinking and replaces them with the perfection of Christ. Think about what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Because the more we do that, the more we keep putting into practice all that you learned and received from me, God says. Everything that you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace, then, look at that, then the God of peace, not any other time, then the God of peace, then the God of peace will be with you every day, every moment. So if you and I want to see these things change, we have to go back to that first question I asked today. Are you or am I ready and willing to commit to and applying God's word every day? Because if you are, then we'll put this into practice. Keep putting it into practice and you'll find greater security. You'll ward off worry and every day will be different from now on. Been help today? So I'm just gonna ask every single one of you, if you would like to see that in your life in some way, those of you watching online, every single one of us in the room, if you're hoping to see more of God's security in your life, more of God's safety poured into your life, then why don't you just pray with me quickly? Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for all that you are and all that you've done. I pray today for every person in this room, everyone watching online, that you will pour such confidence and peace into each and every one of us. Help us, Father, I pray, to convert worry into conversations with you. Help us, Jesus, to, to change our thinking diet, 
to think healthy, to eat healthy, to receive all that's good in the world, to think of the things that are pure and lovely and excellent, worthy of praise. And Father, we trust you today, each of us, that you will help us to ward off worry as we draw closer and more intimate with you. In Jesus' name, with your heads bowed, no one looking around. The greatest place to start is, the, is, is a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. Converting our worry into a conversation with Jesus starts with having a relationship with Jesus. Perhaps you're watching somewhere online and you would not call yourself close to Jesus and you know that you'd like to draw closer to Him. Maybe you're thinking, I need to be more willing to engage with Jesus. Well, no matter where you're watching from online, why don't you make a decision right now to say yes to Jesus. And to each and every one of us in the room, there are some of us here today who have an intimate relationship with Jesus and it's been a little bit tough over the last period of time and maybe we've just waned in our commitment or maybe you just need to recommit yourself to his purposes. But there are two groups of people that I particularly want to talk to. Maybe the first group of people. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I'm talking to you quickly. If you do not have an intimate relationship with Jesus, why don't you make a decision right now to do that? The second group of people is maybe you once had, but you've drifted far from him. You've allowed the worries and anxieties of life to pull you away from a relationship with Christ. You can fix that right now. How? Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. He also says, he who believes has everlasting life. And what Jesus is saying is that you don't have to jump through hoops. Jesus wants you right the way you are. He's not interested in you becoming perfect or different or more anointed or clever or smart or wealthier. He just wants right where you are for you to say yes to him. How and why? Because all he wants you to do is believe that he loves you beyond measure. What do you need to believe? That Jesus is the son of God. That he lived on this planet for 33 years, never once fell short of God's standards. He allowed the very creation he created to beat him, to reject him, to humiliate him, to nail him onto a cross on which he died. You know what happened? He was buried. Three days later, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, raised him to life. And that means that because he's been raised to life, you and I can have an intimate friendship with God on earth and for eternity. So what do you need to do? Well, Jesus gave us that hint too. He said, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. And he who hears and opens the door and invites me and I'll dine with him and he with me. And I'd love to give you that opportunity today. Those those of you watching online, those of you in the room, all you have to do is say yes to Jesus. You can say, I'm opening up the door of my heart, Jesus. Please come into my life. So right where you are, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ or you once have, but you've drifted far from him, can I encourage you just to say, yes, Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. And if you do that right where you are, your life begins to change. The trajectory of your life has shifted forever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. For each and every one of you who would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the first time or come back to Him because you've drifted literally far from Him. On the count of three, shoot your hand up. But if I see your hand, I'm going to ask you to put it down. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front or stand up. The purpose of raising your hand is just to make you and give you a sense of security that you've actually done something physical for yourself and that you know that your relationship with Jesus has begun. So here we go. One two, three. Quickly, shoot your hands up. Wonderful. Many hands. Keep them up. Keep them up. I don't want to miss anyone. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep them up. Thank you. 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 Wonderful. All over the room. Beautiful. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Our time is gone. I want to give you one more opportunity. If there's anyone else, quickly shoot your hand up. I wish I'd raised my hand, but I didn't. Quickly, your time is now. Shoot your hand up. Say yes. Pray for me too. And I'll pray for you. Is there anyone else? Thank you. See your hand. Wonderful. Anyone else? Father, I pray for every person with their hands raised this morning. Pray that you'll meet with them right where they are, transform them, change them. I pray, Lord, that you'll help them to sense your presence tangibly, that they'll know that they've connected with you. In the precious name of Jesus. Will you pray out loud with me, particularly those of you who've raised your hands. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I commit my life to you. I'm sorry for my sins. Please come into my life. And from this day forward, I will follow you. In Jesus' name. Anyone said? Come on, give God a massive hand. That's amazing.
What an incredible service. We truly hope that it helped. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus, congratulations, we're celebrating with you. We want to encourage you to scan the QR code right now and we can help you on that journey, help you with that decision. What does that mean? What is your next step? We want to encourage you, you only have one next step and that's fast forward. Fast forward is the on-ramp into church life. It will help you understand your decision, help you understand your next step, help you understand how to get integrated into church life. So sign up for fast forward once again, you can scan the QR code and we can get you connected through that as well. But remember, we say this each week, each one, reach one. Let's keep connecting. Let's keep reaching. Let's keep inviting. And we will see you next time.